Let's continue with some neuroradiological signs and odd minis involving inflammatory and infectious diseases of the central nervous system. So these are the signs and odd minis we're going to discuss. I'm not going to read them out loud. Let's just look at the images. And I'm going to start with some, well, you, I don't really know if we can call them signs or if they're more like odd minis. I'm going to show you some very typical imaging findings that move, that should make you think multiple sclerosis. Now, you see that the title of this slide is called Beyond McDonald. We know the McDonald criteria. We use them in each and every patient suspected of having multiple sclerosis or if there's a follow-up of multiple sclerosis. But there are situations in whom there is no clinical suspicion of multiple sclerosis um, and, and whom we don't immediately use them, but in whom, nevertheless, signs can be present that should make us think multiple sclerosis. And what are those? Well, first of all, the typical Dawson fingers. We have the black holes and we have the open ring or the horseshoe enhancement. Let's look at Dawson's fingers. What are Dawson's fingers? Those are periventricular white matter lesions. Now, white matter lesions are not infrequent in the general population and we see more of them as we age. They are often, they often have a microvascular origin, especially in older patients. And they can also, in older patients, be located in the vicinity of the ventricles, but if your periventricular lesions are located almost perpendicular on the surface of the lateral ventricles, that's a very suspicious for demyelinating plaques. These are periventricular uh, white matter lesions that are located along the periventricular venules, and demyelination typically occurs along venules and if you see this morphology think multiple sclerosis here we see dawson one of the characters from the 90s series dawson's creek and these are his fingers now the lesions are not named after dawson from dawson's creek but after a radiologist or a pathologist i'm not really sure who first described this morphology let's move on to the next characteristic or imaging that you should know and should make you think multiple sclerosis, those are the so-called black holes. Demyelinating lesions, especially chronic demyelinating lesions, can be very dark on T1 weighted images. That's why we call them black holes. And this is quite typical for multiple sclerosis. And I have seen cases in whom patients older patients but older patients can also have multiple sclerosis I had a lot of white matter lesions and because microvascular disease is so prevalent in the older population this was considered microvascular white matter disease but this patient also had a lot of black holes now you can have old lacunar infarctions and these will also look like black holes but when you have a lot of them and especially when they are located immediately along the ventricles that looks more like the black holes of multiple sclerosis so if you have a lot of holes in the in the brain and these holes are black think multiple sclerosis because these are very suggestive for multiple sclerosis and if you don't believe me i'm going to compare these images with those of a patient with classical microvascular white matter changes here we see the flare images we see a lot of microvascular white matter changes we see these uh, changes along the ventricles and in the deep white matter but if you look at the t1 weighted images we don't see black holes so as said you can have black holes if you also have some old lacunar infarctions but that will mostly be one or two uh, old lacunar infarctions, not a lot and not located immediately along the ventricles. The next sign that should make us think demyelinating disease is open, the open ring sign or the horseshoe enhancement sign. And that is something we typically see in demyelinating lesions. So here we see a T1-weighted image with gadolinium. This is a demyelinating plaque located along the cortex. So it's a juxtacortical lesion. And we see the typical open ring enhancement with a rim of enhancement located towards the centrum of the brain or located medially. And for comparison, a few other demyelinating lesions. So in the majority of cases, we will see the ring uh, at the inner side 
side of the brain. Here are some other lesions. Here the pattern is reversed, but that has to do with the fact that this lesion origin that this lesion originated along the ventricles. So the point of origin is probably along the ventricles. So this is the active zone of demyelination. Uh, item here, but here the point of origin is probably the juxtacortical white matter. And here we see several demyelinating white matter lesions, and we can also see them in the spinal cord. So this is a patient with demyelinating lesion in the spinal cord with the typical open ring sign or the horseshoe enhancement sign. So all these pathognomonic for multiple sclerosis, well, true pathognomonic uh, signs or all minis are actually quite rare, I think. You, you never reach 100% or you at least also have, an, have to keep an open mind. So there's a report specificity for open ring enhancement for demyelination of 80 to 99%. So those are good odds. The sensitivity, however, is a lot lower. So if you don't have the sign, it basically doesn't mean anything. You also, you know, and it makes sense because you have multiple sclerosis lesions with no enhancement or maybe an other pattern of enhancement. So it's a strong diagnostic clue in favor of demyelination, but it's not definitive. Okay. Then let's move on to three old minis. So three very typical patterns or signs that can lead you to the correct diagnosis provided you know them. And entities are actually quite rare. And this is where I find these old minis or these radiological signs very handy. Let's start with this lesion. We see on the sagittal T2 weighted image an abnormality located in the parietal temporo occipital transition area. And if you look carefully, this lesion looks a bit like an onion bulb or an onion skin, uh, and it's called the onion bulb sign. And it's a pattern that is associated with a specific demyelinating disorder. Let's once again magnify, let's now magnify this lesion a bit so you can appreciate it a bit more. It looks like an onion, right? So hence onion bulb sign. And it's uh, a disease first described on pathology in the 40s by a Hungarian pathologist called Joseph Ballo. It's a tumefactive demyelinating lesion and the rings are caused by areas of demyelination alternating with uh, areas of reserved or preserved myelination. So this is Balos concentric sclerosis. And this is a rare form of demyelination, but the imaging pattern is so typical that this can lead you to the correct diagnosis. Another similar disorder is the following. Here we see a a patient with an area of oedema. And this area of oedema is located in the left thalamus and extends in the left cerebral peduncle of the midbrain or the mesencephalon. And this looks a bit like a waterfall or a cascade, and it's called a cascade sign. And this should make you think neurobechet disease. Will this always be neurobechet disease? No, this can be a small metastasis surrounded by oedema. And if the metastasis is located in the thalamus, it can have this same pattern. But if you're dealing with a patient with, for instance, Turkish roots or originating from somewhere along the old Silk Road, and you see this pattern of edema and you have no real explanation of what you're looking at, think neurobechet. Neurobechet is a rare inflammatory disorder, at least in my part of the world. It's definitely more prevalent in, uh, for instance, Turkey, the Middle East, China, so countries along the old Silk Road. That's because there's a genetic genetic component involved. Anyways, if you see this pattern, consider it, consider the possibility because otherwise maybe nobody will think about it. So cascade sign is in my opinion, a useful sign. I've only made a few diagnoses of neurobechet in my career, but in, I think about two of those and it's only like three times or so I suggested it. I actually use the cascade sign to suggest the diagnosis. So I find it useful. Another sign that's useful um, is the following. Here we see a patient who had subacute cerebellar signs and cranial nerve palsies. And we see areas of edema involving both middle cerebellar peduncles. Okay, and now let's look at the T1 weighted image with gadolinium, and we see a lot of small enhancing dots. So it looks a bit as if someone peppered the brainstem and the cerebellum, and especially the middle cerebellar peduncles. And this pattern, so the peppered pons and the peppered cerebellum, should make you think clipperous, which is a chronic inflammatory disorder characterized by lymphocytic infiltration and inflammation typically uh, also with 
enhancement perivascular, so the dot-like perivascular enhancement at the brainstem, the PONS, that, as you know, responds extremely well to steroids. So this is the image before steroids. This is a couple of days after the initiation of a treatment with steroids. So, okay, clippers, also a rare disorder, but with a very characteristic imaging pattern. And those, I believe, are the most grateful uh, entities uh, where we can use neuroradiological signs and ONT minis. This is a patient with a longitudinal extensive myelitis. We can see on the sagittal T2 weighted image an area of edema involving the entire cervical spinal cord. Uh, transverse myelitis has is basically a descriptive diagnosis. It means we have a myelitis involving a long part of the spinal cord uh, and it can have a lot of causes, but one of those has a sign associated with it. And if you look, on the axial images, we can see the gray matter, which basically stands a bit out, is even more hyperintense than the white matter of the spinal cord. And it looks a bit like the letter H. And if you see this, the H sign, that's very suggestive for MOGAT. MOGAT, as you know, is an antibody-mediated uh, autoimmune inflammatory disorder of the white matter. These patients have autobody um, antibodies against MOG, uh, which is mild myeline oligodendrocyte uh, or well, let me think myeline okay I can't really remember it it's myeline oligodendrocytic glycoprotein I believe yeah I think I'm correct uh, they have antibodies against that it's a protein located in the myelin sheet and it leads to demyelination this all makes sense um, and uh, if you have it in the spinal cord, if you see the H sign, it's more prevalent. It's not pathognomonic. It's never, and these signs are rarely 100% pathognomonic. You can also see it in NMOSD, for instance, but it's a lot more prevalent or more strongly associated with MOGAT. So if you see it, think MOGAT. And this brings us to infectious disorder of the central nervous system. Also here, we're going to discuss several imaging signs. And here are three signs that prove you have a parasite in the brain. We have the cyst with dot sign, we have the eccentric target sign, and we have the concentric target sign. Let's examine these signs in a bit more detail, and let's start with the cyst with dot sign. This finding is almost pathognomonic, if not pathognomonic, for neurocysticercosis. It is a parasitic disorder in which you have cysts which contain the neurocysticercosis larva. And that's the dot. That's basically the larva or the head of the larva inside the cyst. And the cyst is meant to protect the larva in the brain. So here is the parasite. Once again, we see the dot. That's the parasite. That's the larval head. And we see the protective cyst surrounding it. And here's another example and yet another example. So the dot, as said, is the larval head or the entire larva. I'm not really sure. And you can see this dot it doesn't really matter what sequence you're looking at, just look for a dot, either on T2-weighted images, on flare images, susceptibility-weighted images, or your T1-weighted images with gadolinium. And if you have a strong suspicion of neurocysticercosis, but you can't really see the dot or you're not sure, do higher resolution T2-weighted images, like a cis, uh, KISS rather, or a 3D Fiesta. And here we see a small cyst with a small dot, but that was for us enough to uh, strongly suggest or favor the diagnosis neurocysticercosis. So do high resolution 3D T2 weighted sequences when in doubt. This brings us to the next parasite. Over here we see a lesion on T2 weighted images while well, patient has multiple lesions, but we're going to focus on the one in the right frontal lobe. And we see that it is composed of con uh, alternating hyperintense and hypointense rings. This is called the concentric target sign, and it kind of makes sense. We have concentric, it looks a bit like a concentric target. But the same patient has a different pattern on T1-weighted images with gadolinium. This is the same lesion. We would expect to see enhancement of alternating rings. We don't see that. We just see enhancement of the outermost ring. And then we have like an enhancing eccentric dot. This is the eccentric target sign. And these both signs combined are very suggestive for cerebral toxoplasmosis. How do you get those or how do you explain those signs? And the cyst with dot sign uh, 
it was basically a protective cyst surrounding a larva. Is that the case here? Not really. It's also a parasitic infection, but it's not as if we are now here looking at the larva. Uh, there are also, this is not how this works here. This is an area of inflammation caused by a parasitic infection. We can call it toxoplasmosis abscess, although it is not a true abscess because it doesn't contain pus. We see a small enhancing wall surrounding the area of inflammation and we see like the eccentric target which is very often identified in toxoplasmosis lesions that are located superficially near the cortex or along the cortex. And how do you get that sign? Well, pathologically, there have been pathological studies. This is the area of toxoplasmosis infection inflammation. And the eccentric dot is basically these lesions tend to arise along the cortex. They can surround a sulcus. And the eccentric target sign is basically a leash of inflamed vessels extending down the sulcus and entering the lesion. So that's the explanation for the eccentric target sign. And it's actually very specific in my experience for toxoplasmosis. But keep in mind that toxoplasmosis is an infection that is mm, rarely encountered in uh, immunocompetent patients. So it's uh, typically seen in immunodepressed patients and then HIV patients. So if you see that sign in an HIV patient, I immediately say, oh, this is going to be toxoplasmosis, especially if the patient also has the concentric target sign, which is a sign described on T2-weighted images and consisting of these alter alternating T2 hyper and hypo intense rings. And this is because pathologically, these lesions consist of areas of hemorrhage uh, surrounded by a liquefaction and necrosis, and then another area of hemorrhage and so on. And the end result is the concentric target sign. So alter, alternating areas of hemorrhage and necrosis or edema. So all in all, if you have a patient with HIV, a concentric target sign and an eccentric target sign, all in the same patient, think cerebral toxoplasmosis. The next sign involves shrimps in space. What does this entail? This is a patient with large lesions in the brain and with one very large lesion located in the left cerebral hemisphere. There is a little mass effect despite the large size of the lesion, which should make you think this is something that actually destroys brain parenchyma, because if it was something that was, uh, let's say, if it was pure edema or a tumor, it would cause mass effect, okay? So it doesn't do that. And if you look surrounding the lesion, you see a lot of very small dots, and it, they look a bit like stars. They look like a Milky Way. If you see that, well, that's a sign of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, which is an opportunistic viral infection that is typically seen in immunocompromised patients, typically HIV patients. Let's magnify these images a bit. We see here the area of demyelination, and we see the many little stars surrounding the area of demyelination. And the total image looks a bit like the Milky Way, which is why we call it the Milky Way sign. I also find this a useful sign, the small dots. Basically, we have the large area of demyelination and the small dots correspond to the infection uh, spreading through perivascular spaces to other parts of the brain or to the white matter surrounding the main area of demyelination. This is on flare images. This is on T2 weighted images. And the shrimp sign, this is also a sign described in patients with progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. So for one reason or another, the middle cerebellar peduncles are a preferred location for PML. And when you have PML over there, the edema can extend along the dentate nucleus. The dentate nucleus is gray matter, so it is not really uh, involved or involved all that much. And then the edema surrounding the dentate nucleus can look a bit like a shrimp. Personally, I think this belongs to the yeah, you know, one guy once saw it in one case and decided to make it into a sign uh, because, uh, I don't know, uh, I, I, I don't really find it all that useful, but maybe that's just me or that's personal preference. I also don't know how pathognomonic this is. I think the Milky Way sign is probably a lot more specific for PML than the shrimp sign, but I'm not sure. Okay, and that concludes signs and infectious and inflammatory disorders. On to the next topic.